what what's the problem or why is Israel a challenge for uh, for a Jewish religion? And so to begin with, what I want to uh, start with is what is the place of the land of Israel in the Jewish religion? We need to understand that before we can go into uh, why is Israel also as a state a challenge. So if we go into Jewish law, and again, if there's any questions, because I'm pretty going pretty deep into some uh, terminology. So if there's any, any kind of questions, please don't uh, hesitate to ask. So in Halakha, which is Jewish law, which is the stuff, the, the codex of rules and regulation that governs uh, Jewish life, the land of Israel has a very, uh, has an elevated uh, status. It is not a land like any other land which, well, I wouldn't say elevated, I would say a different status. So there are some things that you can do in Israel and not do, and again, I call the land Israel, but you can call it Judaic, you can call it the Holy Land, you can call it Palestine, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, but in, in Hebrew, you call it the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, and that's why I'm calling it Israel, because land of Israel is a bit long. But it is, it's not a political terminology, it's just out of the Hebrew discourse. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm calling it Israel. Um, so, so there are things that you're allowed to do there and not outside. And there are things that you're allowed to do outside and not in it. For instance, there's a rule that every seven years, you shouldn't toil the land. So every seventh year, basically, you should not have any agricultural activity on the land. You're not allowed to plow. You're not allowed to, to harvest, basically. You're not allowed to um, water. You're not allowed to put chemicals, whatever. The land needs to rest for a year, okay? But that is only true for the land of Israel. So this does not, so if I live in, um, in Austria or in India or in America, it's not a problem for me any, any time of any year to plant a tomato. But I have friends that they want a garden. They bought a house and they, they want to plant a garden in their house. But they bought the house on the seventh year. So they cannot make a garden on the seventh year. They need to wait till the new year starts. And only then they can plant their grass and the trees that they want and so forth, okay? So that's a real difference. If they would have been any other place outside of Israel, it wouldn't have been a problem. But in Israel, it is a problem. The same thing applies to ma'asir. So if you, if you have an avocado tree, which is a problem in Vienna, let's say you have an apple tree. In Vienna, you can have an apple tree also. Basically, you're supposed to give 10% of these apples away to the priests at the time or poor people, whatever, whatever it is. We don't, won't go into it. But that's, again, only in trees in the land of Israel. This does not apply to fruit growing outside of the land of Israel. Also in marriage law, if I tell my wife, we live in Vienna, if I tell my wife, I want to move to Paris. If she says no, and I insist, I cannot divorce her because she didn't want to move to Paris with me. But if I tell her, I want to move to Haifa, which is in the land of Israel, and she says no, I have grounds for divorce now. Okay, so, and also the other way around. So if I'm in Israel and I say, tell to my wife, I want to leave now to, uh, uh, nah, I don't know, Pondicherry, okay? I want to move to Pondicherry and she tells me, no, nothing I could, uh, nothing, you know, it's okay. If I insist, she can divorce me because I want to leave the land of Israel, okay? 
Okay, so, so the land of Israel, whatever the borders are, and we're not going to go into that, has special status in Jewish law. Okay, so this is not just of Jewish law. This is also true in Jewish prayer. Jewish prayer is full of, of uh, the land of Israel. And here I just uh, copied one, one thing from one of the, from, uh, the prayer book, something that we're praying three times a day in the, the Shemona Yisrael, in the core prayer of the, of, the, of the Jewish prayer. Blow a great blow for our freedom and carry a sign to gather our exiles and gather us quickly from the four corners of the earth to our land. Blessed are you, Lord, gatherer of the furthest of his people, Israel. So here we, we pray, and there are other prayers that relate, other blessings and prayers that relate to this, that we want to rebuild Jerusalem. We want everybody to assemble in, in the land of Israel. And again, this is not something invented in the last 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. These are prayers that were set thousands of years ago. And we are still using those prayers wherever we are. So it's just to, to show that the land of Israel is not like other lands in the Jewish mind or psyche or religion or whatever you want to call it. Also within the uh, Jewish tradition, when you marry, I don't know if you've seen films uh, about Jewish weddings, but there's also always the bit that the, um, the broom breaks the glass. And when he breaks the glass, that's what everybody says, Mazal tov! Everybody says Mazal tov when everybody's happy because this is the last thing, the last bit in the ceremony of the wedding, the religious ceremony. But actually it's supposed to be the saddest bit because this is when we are remembering the, the brokenness of our land, that we were exiled from our land and that the city of Jerusalem and the temple were broken and were destroyed. And whenever you're say, whenever he's the, the groom is breaking the glass, he recites this uh, little this text, which says, "I need to raise Jerusalem at the pinnacle of my joy." So now when I'm getting married, and I am the most joyous, I have to remember Jerusalem and its state, mostly. Not a good state. It lies in ruin, basically. Yeah? Before, up until um, seven years or whatever, 40 years, whatever you, you want. Uh, also, so this is traditional stuff. And what also from a kind of theological perspective, what do we mean when Jews mean they are waiting for the Messiah there's different ideas and there's an argument also within Jews what exactly it means. What does it mean? What, what is the Messiah supposed to do? But one of his most important function, functions is to, as, as I wrote here, this is from the Talmud, from Sanhedrin, from the Talmud. The difference between this world and the Messianic era is only with regard to servitude to foreign kingdoms alone, as they will leave Eretz Israel. So this means the only job of the Messiah is to gather all the Jews to the land of Israel and have a politically independent, whatever it is, state, kingdom, whatever, in the land of Israel. This is a clear sort of political function that the Messiah has. And not necessarily, I mean, it of course has a lot of religious stuff uh, uh, that's, that's related to it. I'm sorry, I cannot see the chat. I'm gonna open the chat on the side. Yeah, I see. All Jews, I'm gonna relate to it in a second. Uh, okay. There's Stissel here, I see. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so 
it says not all Jews will fit in, in Israel. It depends how you stack them, right? But um, um, nobody thought uh, 100 years ago that 10 million people will fit in the small land of Israel, but they do. Uh, today, they, they do. So, you know. Um, oh, I went too far here. Wait a second. Yeah. So we see here, this is like the next prime minister is the Mashiach because the next prime minister has a, the, the, sorry, the, the Messiah has a political function, not only a religious one. Um, okay. So I don't know if I, you can remind me if I'm over the time. I think maybe I'll show one more and then we'll, one more thing. And then we'll go into the next bit. Um, here we see a, a poem that was written in the 11th century by Yuda Levi, where he, his religious uh, uh, emotion is, is, uh, is uh, actually this longing for the land of Israel, for the temple. This is a very, very famous a poem in Hebrew that he wrote in Hebrew. And in, he wrote it in Spain, in uh, Muslim Spain. And uh, I'll, I'll read it, but I, you know, if there's questions about it, I can, I can talk about it, but I'll just read it. My heart is in the East, the East Spain, the utmost East. At the time, there is no America. Spain is the most East you can go. Sorry, my aunt. The other way around, I'm sorry, I was confused. My heart is in the East, retaining, pertaining to Israel, but I'm at West's edge in Spain, right? The most West you can go is Spain, although my, his heart is in the East. How shall I taste what I eat and how shall it be enjoyable? Zion is in, is in the land of Edom and I am in the chains of Arad, uh, of Arab, whatever that means, because at the time uh, Israel or Zion, the land of Israel was under uh, Christian rule, under the um, Crusades. And in rabbinical discourse, they are Adam. And <clears throat> Spain at the time was under the Muslims, under the Arabs. It is easier for me to leave all the bounty of Spain then it is precious for my eyes to see the dirt of a desolated temple. So in this uh, poem, he poetically expresses his yearning, his, his uh, you know, he misses the land of Israel even, and even though he was never there. And at the end of his life, he did go there. He went on a journey at the end of his life. And according to, uh, legend or to tradition, he was killed by a knight at the gates to Jerusalem. He was run down by a knight. I don't know if it's Muslim or, or a Christian, there's various uh, stories. But this longing that we see in the prayers, which are from the first centuries, from the halakha and the customs that are in late uh, antiquity, from the poems in the Middle Ages. We also see this in the uh, modern era. So starting 16th, 17th century by messianic figures like Shabtai Tzvi and, and Shlomo Molcho, which they were, they were want to be messiahs or they were messiahs, depends who you're asking. But um, a part of their, of the whole thing that they did as messiahs was going to the political authorities and asking for permission to, for Jews to settle in Israel. So Shabtai Tzvi, when he said he said he is the messiah, people in Europe packed up all their stuff and said, the messiah is here, we're going to Israel. And he went to the Sultan in Istanbul 
and told the Sultan, I am here, the Messiah of the Jews. Please let me bring the Jews to Israel and give us some autonomy there. And that was the end. Because the Sultan told him, no problem. Now choose. You want your head off or do you want to convert to Islam? And he and all of his followers converted to Islam. Until today, you have followers of Shabtai Tzvi in Turkey, which are Muslims, but they have, you know, their own sort of uh, peculiarities. Of course, I'm not going to go into that. But the whole story of this Messiah ended once he tried to tachles, be the Messiah. Once he wanted to really be the political Messiah, which the Jews really wanted all the time. That is somebody who will enable Jews to settle in Israel. So, so I'm not going to talk about, so in a way, when we're talking about a Jewish state, it's a utopia from a religious perspective. It is something that the Messiah is supposed to bring. It is something that has a very divine connection. It is not a state like all other states. And what do we do with this now? How do we handle a real state with a real government and a real army and a real police force and real problems and real poverty and real atrocities, let's say, I don't know, whatever, real economic issues, real political issues. How do we deal with this thing? It's supposed to be a utopia, but it's not always a utopia. So what do you do with it? This is a real issue. It's a real challenge because you're supposed to, you know, what do you do with this dream? What, you know, and there's all sorts of solutions to that and sorts of ideas about that. And that's what we're going to go to later. So I hope I may have taken a little bit too much time. I think maybe five minutes, maybe more. I don't know. I wasn't really, uh, my eye wasn't on the clock. So the next thing that, that I want to um, ask is that we now go into, uh, how do you call them? Work rooms? No, how do you call them? Breakout rooms. Breakout rooms, right. To breakout rooms. And there, everybody has access to, uh, I'll do it again. I'll, uh, you can send it. Huh? I'll resend it. So now I'm sending, did I wait? Now I'm, I'm resending a link to a um, presentation. In this presentation, there are slides. And from, I think, the third slide, you will find all sorts of texts, short texts, about the state of Israel. Um, what I'm asking, we, maybe we'll give 15 minutes, OK? Um, to read the text and to see how does this text maybe translate to a political action? What kind of action? What, do they, what does it say about the place of uh, the state in regard to religion, in, 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 this, in the religion in regard to the state? And does the state think there is some kind of standard Judaism that can uh, say, okay, what does the state need to look like? Um, we were talk discussing about the Bible part, whether the Bible is a mandate, and we came up with more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. The Very questions cool. were, um, when you refer to the Bible, does it mean the whole thing or is just the Old Testament? Oh, wow. Because when the New Testament <laughs> is, is a different rules and yeah, and... Um, I personally was interested in what is the percentage of the the Jews um, in today's world where they are those secular secular Jews who follows the more like the 
the laws of the world or the countries where they live in and um and the conservatives or who still follows uh rigid uh, all these other rules that is bounded by uh, by the land of israel yeah uh i think we we came up with more questions than answers but it was a good discussion yeah <laughs> that's a good jewish di discussion if you have more questions and answers that's the best <laughs> um so um so you you read a quotation from Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, and he yeah. was 110% secular. Okay. This guy had nothing religious in him, but very proud Jew, very conscious, very literate, and he didn't mean it from a religious perspective. He meant it from a secular perspective. And I'm not going to, and we can talk about why, maybe in the Q&A, mm -hmm. but his intention was, 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 was secular. Why did he use the Bible? Because the Bible is a book, regardless of it being a religious book, it's a book. And it's a book that proves that Jews wrote the book in the land of Israel. So that's why he saw it as important, not because mm -hmm. of its religious function. Okay, so okay. any questions about this? I mean, this, these all can be very big discussion. Um, so if you have any questions or, or anything, you can write it down and we'll go back to it because now uh, I don't know if we have time for it. Uh, wait. Um, so Mandy, or I don't know who was in the same group. Who was not in the same group as Amy? Who was in a different group? I guess most of you. Mandy, can you talk? Or Susan? Yeah, but I was in a group with Susan, and so, okay, we, so we agreed on Susan being, being our spokesperson. So please, Susan, as the, as the spokesperson. Okay. Um, well, we started off looking at the wrong quote. Uh, the quote for group one. So, Yuval, would you be kind enough to read the quote for group yes, four again, yes, just to refresh my memory? No what problem. Which one is it? Four. Four. Ah, okay. Four. No problem. Yes. Right. So, what did you? Okay. Okay. What we what we were discussing was this feeling of being at home in Israel, um, and we thought this was a feeling that Zionists had, um, people whose idea was you should go live in Israel, that we have, we Jews have every right, and we should go and live in Israel. Mm -hmm. And so um, we were discussing um, how Jews outside Israel might still feel persecuted and insecure. Um, I gave some examples of Zionists who have no intention of going to live in Israel, but they supported Israel in every way they could and went to visit. I also referred to wealthy Jews who were not Zionists, but uh, supported Israel financially. And um, as for feeling more at home in Israel as a Jew than somewhere else. Um, I think we didn't really get to the bottom of that because we decided this statement was rather anachronistic, that you can feel at home anywhere uh, as a Jew, it does not have to be in Israel. Am I right, Mandy? Did I get it all? Yeah, so we, we, I'm afraid we beat around the bush a little bit. We would have needed to, to discuss a little bit longer. <laughs> Sorry, Yuval. No, that's, that's the way it is always. That's good. That's good that there's always something else to talk about. Um, Oliver? Um, yeah, I was in group three. Okay, please. Yes. If you want to go one slide back, then everyone can see the quote. Yes, of course. Yeah. It's easier. So it was a quote by Herzl and... It, if I'm right, it's the, the founder of Zionism who yeah. lived in the late um, 
19th century, so long before Israel as a state even existed. Mm -hmm. And um, he talks about it, that, uh, that Israel is always going to be an ideal that mm -hmm. can never be reached uh, because it's not only a legal, uh, legal thing about a land that, that's promised, but also a moral and spiritual perfection that they want to achieve and you can never reach perfection. So, um, yeah, and while discussing this, we got a bit into a discussion what, uh, about secularity in, in general. And if Austria, for example, is a secular state, and uh, we didn't have the same, uh, we didn't agree on that, because, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, because uh, in many important issues, uh, the church is still asked about the uh, like we asked the cardinal um, about his uh, what he thinks about um, migration and and immigration and uh, welcoming refugees and uh, other things. Um, but yeah, for my for my side, I I also added that there's a difference between political power and um, moral authority. And here we have both together in. In this idea of Israel, it's it's not only it's political power and um, immoral authority, mm -hmm. and we're also asking ourselves if uh, what it means that that this can never be reached in the end, and this is if if this is um, a kind of frustrating or um, what, what what the goal can be if. If it always has to be an ideal, what's the concrete thing we actually want to achieve? Okay, no, very good. But again, Benjamin, Benjamin Herzl, or Herzl was rather secular. Um, yeah, but it is a very good question. What, what does it mean? What are we striving for with this uh, perfection? Yeah. James told us a little bit about uh, Jabotinsky. Mm -hmm. Uh, that he also was a secular uh, Jew, so and actually uh, he um, was already a political Zionist, or, although political Zionism hadn't evolved, so to say, officially. So he actually gave a little bit of a kickoff for that. Um, yeah, we um, discussed that. Uh, well, in the time that he. Uh, said this was the time when there were pogroms in Russia. Yeah. So probably this, um, what what he meant uh, firstly is the ambition to save millions from their tragic situation has to do with the pogroms and the persecutions that the Jewish people were under in, in the Russian lands at that time. But of course, uh, in the soul of the people, the word Zionism shows that regardless if you are religious, religious or secular, it's like in the DNA of the Jewish people to have this longing for Zion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this, yeah, this longing is actually expressed everywhere in a, in a wedding, like you told, like treading on this glass and thinking of the brokenness of the land, etc. cetera. So um, it's, it's part of the tradi Jewish tradition also. So even for a secular person, he feels this, longing for Zion mm -hmm. and what what um, actually accelerated probably uh, is that these programs um, led the people to want to return to Zion. We discussed about uh, the movement for the return on the land of uh, Israel and uh, what kind of views they were having, what kind of group were there and as someone was socially, someone was uh, visionary with respect to the communist and other other uh, relig religious wise movement and all those things so and then we discuss about the independence of israel in which year they celebrated and how that how that entire process work out so yeah. something related to that on the on the we discuss about it would, okay. you like to, would you also like to contribute to that no, no, that's fine. I think that's good. Francesca, did you want to add something? Um, I can add. Um, in the beginning, there was a discussion about the beginning of the movement. When was it? 
So we get in the like 19th century that in the beginning of something there's always a dispute about yeah different possibilities and when there's nothing you can develop everything that they so that's why there is this a possibility of different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So uh, we had a little bit of uh, uh, we, we could not understand. So we understand. Uh, how can not be a Zionist? We understand the concept of the Zionist, uh, yeah. but we fail to see uh, what do you say when you know God Himself is a Zionist. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, that's a... something that baffled both of us, really? and we were not able to understand that whole uh, ideology. Okay. Uh, maybe because we neither of us are Jewish, so that could be one <laughs> one uh, problem there. Okay, good. So, what did you think about it? What did you or uh, really. So that's that's where the problem is. When we understand the whole idea of being, uh, say, if you're looking at um, living from a perspective in today's world, from a perspective of a religion, uh, mm -hmm. from a religious point of view, it can be very complicated because there are so many things. Uh, for example, if in, we are talking about it in Christianity's terms, uh, you know, the way Jesus would uh, tell us, you know, love your enemies. But at the same time, we are standing at war with you know, our neighboring country. So uh, in that terms, Zionism is very difficult, uh, a very difficult, a very um, different, difficult way to live. So that's what we feel is um, kind of puts you in, at a question. Is that the right thing right now for this current situation that we are in? Okay, so I will I will try to explain a little bit. So it is a bit of a joke, a bit of a joke, but he did mean it seriously. In in this term, that uh, he's a rabbi, he's a very Zionist rabbi, he's the Zionist rabbi. He lived in the beginning of the twentieth century, end of the nineteenth. He was the first European um, chief rabbi in the land of Israel. And he, what he meant is God in the Bible clearly, or according to Jewish tradition, God wants the Jewish people to live in the land of Israel. That's what he wants us. That's he, what he wants for us. That's where he sent us from Egypt. That's the future that he envisions for us. So he's a Zionist. So that's why as a Jew, you have to be a Zionist because God himself is Zionist. So that's sort of what he means. Of course, he means it a bit, he says it a bit joking. Okay. But if, but if, you, if you look at it from, from a Christian perspective, it is a kind of put forward in a kind of imitatio dei. You know, you need to, be like God, you know? If, if God is nice, you need to be nice like God. If God is forgiving, you need to be forgiving like God. So if God is Zionist, you need to be like God, be a Zionist, okay? So, if, so that's kind of, uh, you know, I mean, I'm trying to link sort of Jewish and, and Christian theology, but it's a bit hard. Um, but basically that's, that's what he's, kind of trying to say. I hope I didn't confuse too much. Um, is it okay? I mean, if you have more questions, it's fine. Uh, you can ask. Yes, please. Can I? Yeah, can I? Please, please. Because you, you, you said with imitatio day, but isn't there um, also a similar um, view in, in Jewish religion where to be I don't know, it's, it's Heiligung, in, we learned it as Heiligung in German, but to get more holy is to be, um, to become more like God in his, in his attributes or not becoming God, that, that's very different from it, but, but yeah. um, and if God is then a Zionist then, and this is an attribute of God, shouldn't you also become a more yeah, Zionist? Well, of course it doesn't, no, no, it, the, 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 the whole point of uh, the whole point is that it doesn't work in Judaism. Imitatio Dei doesn't work in Judaism because God is not a, a person. Like in, in Christian Christianity, you can do it because God 
it was a miracle and God was uh, uh, um, how do you call it? incarnated, right? So you can try to be like him because he was somehow incarnated. In Judaism, this is an absurd. You cannot do it. I mean, there's no, like, the, the most you can aspire to is to be at one with God, you know? But you cannot imitate God because God is not imitatable. He's not like, how can I be like a rock? How can I be like something that I cannot even imagine? It's not, so in, in, in Judaism, it doesn't work really because there's a, the, the divide between God and man is you cannot bridge it. And, the, and there is no, this, this uh, miracle or, you know, this, this God incarnate, it's, it's not possible. That's the whole problem. Kind of the big difference, yeah. Then the converse, why, the yeah, converse please. also works that God cannot be a Zionist if he's inconceivable. Yes, of course, of course, of course. That's why it's a joke. Yeah. That that's why that's why it's a bit jokingly put, because of course not. But the, the what he's trying to say is that the religious religiously. Religiously, Judaism is Zionism, kind of. Again, he's super Zionist. I mean, he's a very, very Zionist figure. So that's why he's saying um, Jews have to be kind of Zionists because Judaism, as we saw, has this, this Zionist uh, um, strata, this Zionist uh, tendency, very, very strong. So... So as a Jew, you have to be Zionist. And the way that he's putting it is a bit weird and unacceptable from a Jewish sort of theological perspective. Um, and, but, you know, that's why it's a bit of a joke. It's a bit of a, you know. Yes, please, Marie-Louise. Marie -Louise. Um, I, I actually thought that, yeah, I, I see that he puts it like a little bit like as a joke, but isn't it because of all the Bible verses where it's said that, and I will bring you back to the land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, God says so often He will bring His people back to the land. Yes. That I thought that was the basis for the sentence that God is a Zionist, so to speak, because He will bring His people back to Zion. Yes. No, exactly. Yes, yes. But the, the, I, I don't want to go into Jewish theology because it's a, it's a, you know, it depends. There's also a lot of strains and, you know, there's like people who are very anti um, talking about God as a personality and people who are very much on the other, you know, if you're that there's also, so I don't want to go into the whole, you know, but exactly right, Marie-Louise, you know, so God appears as a, as a figure very much supporting a move of Jews to the land of Israel. So as a figure, he's a Zionist, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so is there anything else? Anybody else wants to speak or comment or ask anything? If not- And we can proceed. We'll what? Yeah, I, I will proceed, exactly. I don't know how much time I have left um because i wasn't keeping score well we have a bit time of discussion afterwards so maybe some 10 more minutes i would say 10 more minutes okay wow okay 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 so i'm gonna i'm gonna fly by yes. so as you can see here those are some on the bottom you can see um proposals for for the flags of israel and that were historical real proposals and at the top, you can see sort of utopical, how should the flag look like from a communist flag on the uh, left to a multi-religious flag that puts religion in general, not just the Jewish religion, to a more Jewish flag on the right. And on the bottom, uh, on the bottom left, that's the flag that Herzl proposed. And in the middle, that's a drawing of how he proposed it. So in the flag, you can see there are various ideas of what, what is the idea that, that Israel should follow? What is the ideal 
uh, what should this utopia look like? Um, and as we said, you have all sorts of Zionism from practical, practical means actually go there. That's what it means to be Zionist. So it means Zionist after practical. Zionists mean go to Israel and live there. Then you're a Zionist. Then you have political Zionism. No, no, Zionism means we working for a political um, framework in the land of Israel. Spiritual means the spiritual center of the Jewish people should be in Israel. Socialist means a Jewish state must have social values and equality and everybody should get more or less the same. Religious means the state of Israel need to adhere to Jewish law in all, all respects. Revisionist means, well, actually to counter sort of counter socialist. Liberal means it should be a liberal state. All right, so each of them sees the relationship with the Jewish um, tradition and the state differently. Um, so if we look at, um, from the outside, if we look at the, at the Jewish people, and we're trying to see how, what is the makeup of the Jewish people? Here we can see that this is in America, but I think it's, it's quite accurate to the, all of the diaspora outside of Israel. So we can see that here mostly are reform and conservative Jews, which are more progressive Jews, which do not, um, which are more flexible in their view of yeah, in their view of the of the Jewish law, and then you have Orthodox Jews are just ten percent, which is a small number. Again, this is in the diaspora of people who are have a more strict um, idea of how the Jewish law should be followed and how it looks like. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. We don't have any time, but here you can see in pictures how it kind of, let's say, looks like. So the more shtisel looking ultra-Orthodox on here, modern Orthodox, um, conservative, uh, reform, and then the actual faces of a few of the more uh, famous Jewish uh, secular people in the United States. Um, yeah, from, you know, Star Wars uh, star to, um, I don't know, Sarah Silverman. Uh, so that's the European American spectrum. In Israel, the, the spectrum looks a bit different. So we're going to the Israeli uh, Declaration of Independence, which basically looks at it from a more, looks at Judaism or Jews more as a national group and not a religious group. So even here, we can see the opening to the Israeli uh, Declaration of Independence. And the quotation that we saw about the Bible being the, the Bill of Rights, the, 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 uh, the proof that Jews can have their own land, we go back to the Declaration of Independence, we see this return to ancient Judea and ancient Israel as the tradition that the modern state of Israel wants to continue, not as a religious continuation, but as a political continuation of the ancient Jewish state. Um, and when we go further, we see that within this vision of Israel, there's a democratic liberal tendency. That is the state of Israel will be open to immigration and will promote the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants, uh, will be based on the perceptions of uh, percepts of liberty, justice, and peace. General thing taught by the Hebrew prophets, again, going back to a Hebrew national or, or even religious sentiment, and will uphold full social and political equality. Maybe that's a bit of socialist, 
without distinction of race, creed, or sex, liberal, uh, will guarantee full freedom of conscious worship, education, and culture. So you see here this mixing of the various notions of what a Jewish state should look like, combining values from the Jewish tradition, which can be seen as religious, but also as an ethnic or national tradition, and mixing it also with other liberal values. And this is all written and quasi enshrined within the Declaration of Independence. Independence. Israel does not have a constitution. So this is the only document that expresses these kinds of emotions. Because the, Jew, the Israelis couldn't agree on what should be in, 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 in a constitution. Uh, so if we talked about the diaspora spectrum, we can talk about the Israeli spectrum of religiosity that it looks a bit different. So the Israeli spectrum doesn't really take in consideration reform and conservatives um, and, and such. Instead, it kind of has uh, um, traditionalists here. But if we try to map how people define themselves and what they actually do, we can see some mismatches. So here, when we see the general demography, so it talks about how people define themselves. So the people define themselves as ultra-Orthodox or religious or traditional or secular. But if you see what people actually do, you see that it doesn't always match. So people light Shabbat candles. A lot of the people who are secular also light Shabbat candles, which is a religious thing to do. So why do the secular do that? Why do secular people in Israel light Shabbat candles and some eat kosher? Why? Because when you say in Israel secular, it doesn't mean atheist. It doesn't mean that they don't believe in God. Maybe they do believe in God. Maybe they don't. It doesn't mean that they don't keep all of the Jewish law. They will keep some of it. In Israel, of course, it's much easier to keep the Jewish law because it's harder, for instance, to get food, which isn't kosher. Um, so the, the spectrum looks different in Israel versus the diaspora. And people in Israel tend to be more traditional, more conservative, more doing more of, of the, more things from the Jewish tradition, more things from the um, Jewish law, even if they do not define themselves as, as religious, simply because that's what everybody's doing. So if I'm in Austria, I celebrate Christmas and I take Christmas off, not me personally, but a lot of people do, even if they're not religious, they don't define themselves as religious, but they buy gifts for Christmas because that's what everybody does. So in Israel, everybody celebrates these holidays. You don't have to define yourself as religious for it. Instead of just trying to make it clear from a social perspective, how it works. You want? Yes, please. Um, the, do these secular Jews also mean that the state and religion should be separated? Is this also part of the secular idea that's referred to here? Not necessarily. The, 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 the problem of, of the separation of church and state in Europe, it is understood as protecting the state from religion. In America, it is understood as protecting religion from the state, right? So, so in Israel, it's the same. Some people say we need to separate them. If they're secular, they will say we need to separate them so we are not forced to be religious. But some of the religious people 
want a separation, so they are not forced to be Jewish like the state says it's Jewish. Okay? So they also want to safeguard their Judaism by the separation. And we're talking about all sorts of Jews. Other people, again, both secular and religious, will say, we do not want to have a separation of Jewish Jews of, of state and religion, precisely from the same reasons. We want more people, we want people to be more Jewish, and we want people to be more Jewish, more standard Jewish, more Jewish as we say they should be Jewish, right? So, um, so you have both opinions on the religious and the secular uh, bits of the spectrum. Is it clear? So if you, because the, the, the connection of, of um, church, of state and religion can be seen as cor corrosive also to the religion and not just to the state. So also uh, we're, we're going to talk about a little bit, oh, I, I'm probably way off. I probably don't have any time. So I'm just, so this has to do with Judaism in Israel, this connection of state and religion. You have one rabbinical establishment that says who is Jewish. Not exactly true, but to, to a lot of things it is true. This establishment checks who's Jewish. This is establishment says what is kosher and what is not kosher in terms of what can you eat, what you can't eat. Um, and rabbinical law has a lot of say in marriage law, in law pertaining to burial. Um, this is because of the Turks. So this is because the Turkish system originally, I don't know, I think after Atatürk it's not the case, but under the Ottomans, the Turks allowed uh, uh, religious autonomy, so the state does not in, does not uh, uh, interact, it does not um, say disturb the, the the religious communities, but allows them autonomy. But there's only one Jewish or Christian or whatever community, so that community is standardized. So you can't have three types of Jews, like in Austria. There's only one Jewish community, official Jewish community. So you can't have diversity there. So that's, that's something from Ottoman law. And that's a problem. So there is no division of church and state in that term, because the state, the, the, let's say the religious, institutions are funded by the state and operate in the name of the state, okay? I mean, it's, it's very similar to Austria in, in a sense. Um, so in, in Israel, you have a, a, a ministry of religion and the ministry of religion is in charge of all religions. It funds all religions. And if a Christian, if a, a Catholic gets married in Israel, he has to be married by a Catholic priest. There is no civil, uh, yeah, there is no civil marriage. And this means that a Catholic getting married in Israel is, does not have any way to divorce. Because according to Catholic law, there is no divorce, okay? This leads to all sorts of weird uh, situations, but that's the way the Israeli law works. Um, so this also has a lot of uh, relations to Israeli politics because you have religious, uh, religious parties. So here you have religious parties and those, let's say on, we, we're, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, right side now, you can see two, pictures of rabbis, they are not politicians, they are rabbis, but they have a lot of influence because they can tell their followers 
you should vote to this party. And one of these rabbis, the top one, he founded a political party. Even though he was not a politician and he was never a member of parliament, he decided what this party will do. Yeah, he had full control of this party, even if he personally would never stood for election. Um, so you see also in the political sphere, it's not just in, you know, there's no separation of church and state in terms of the state organs, like in Austria, it goes kind of deeper in terms of part, uh, uh, religious groups have specific uh, political parties. That's like the Christian. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mandy. Um, so it's, it's like the Christian Democrats in, in Germany or like the Christian socialists in Austria before the war. I don't think, I don't know if they were after the war, uh, but it's again, this mixture of, of politics and, and religion is very much alive and well in Israel today. So, so as the last two uh, things that I want to talk about kind of is about is from a religious perspective, from a Jewish perspective, is the state of Israel good or bad? Does it have a negative or positive role? And does it have any theological uh, importance? So also on this, you have various opinions. Some people say the state of Israel is the foundation of the state of Israel is a religious act. It is not just a political act. It is a religious act because the state of Israel is a part of the messianic force working in history. So when you found, when you make the state of Israel, you have you're, you're you're actually saying something religious you're either saying that you're inviting the messiah and we're getting nearer to the messianic age or you're saying you're rebelling against god because you're supposed to wait for the messiah and if you're not waiting for god's sent messiah you are rebelling against god and you are furthering the coming of the true Messiah. So again, you can be here. Um, so these are the two extremes. And, but also you could be more moderate. And you can say the state of Israel protects the Jews and allows the Jews independence to fully worship and fully live as Jews. So it's a positive thing, even if it's not theologically important, it's not a religious act that you're doing by having a Jewish state. It is still positive because it allows Jews to be better Jews. But opposedly you can say that the Jewish state is a secular state. So actually, it hinders people from being more religious because it shows them that you can be a non-religious Jew. You have a Jewish state where people can drive on Shabbat. You have a Jewish state where people can buy pork. You have a Jewish state which is not run according to Jewish law. So it is a negative it has a negative impact on the religiosity of the Jews in the state. Yuval, excuse me. Yes. Um, who are these uh, four groups? Clearly, bottom right are the ultra-Orthodox. Yes. So, sorry, it's not all. Okay, so 
the bottom right are the anti-Zionist ultra-Orthodox. Not all of them are. You have Neturi Karta, you have Satmer, you have a few groups. They oppose Israel. They view it as a sin against God. Some of them, a lot of them, live in Israel. The land of Israel is holy, but the state of Israel is a sin. And they do not want to have a, uh, an Israeli ID card. They do not want to take electricity from the state of Israel. They want nothing to do with the institutions of the state of Israel. They are a sin against God. Bottom right, you have ultra-Orthodox, which say, basically, state. Okay, it's not a religious act. You can have a state of Jews. But it's a problem because this state is not Jewish enough. It does not express the, 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 the laws of, 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 of Judaism enough. It is lets people be too secular. This is bottom right now. This is bot. No, this is the top, uh, top right. These are Orthodox people who mm -hmm. think, who see it's religiously neutral. The act of having a state is religiously neutral. You can, you want to have a state, have a state. Doesn't matter. You want to have a new city, have a new city. You want to be organized as a Ferrari, have a Ferrari. It doesn't make any difference religiously, theologically. It's not something that God cares about, but he does care about that you, as a person, fulfill Shabbat. And if the, the state makes you not fill Shabbat because we need people to work on Shabbat, it's, that's a problem. So it's religiously neutral, but it is negative. On the other side, you have the positive, the people who think it is religiously neutral, but it's a positive because Jews now live with other Jews and they can, and they don't, you know, th there's not uh, Christmas songs, you know, starting in November, right? All the time on, on the radio. So you live among Jews, everybody celebrates uh, Pesach, you celebrate Pesach. Everybody celebrates uh, Hanukkah, let's say. So you celebrate Hanukkah. You don't have the temptation. Well, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, so I'll buy Christmas gifts. Because you live with other Jews. It's not a problem. So it makes you a better Jew to live in Israel among Jews. So it's religiously neutral, but it's positive. And then you have the bottom uh, left which say this is a part of the messianic plan. This is what we're supposed to do. This is what God wants us to do. Like we saw in uh, Rabbi uh, Cook, this is a part of uh, God's plan. He wants us to create the state and then we are more worthy for the Messiah to come. We are on the right track for the Messiah to come. We are better in the eyes of God for having a state. So it's not just, you know, is it, is it easier to be Jewish or not? It's theologically loaded. Is that clear? Yes, yeah, so oh. these are more conservative Jews, bottom left. They are more, yeah, more orthodox. They're all orthodox, basically. Mm. They're all orthodox. Um, but you have a, a similar spectrum also in, in conservative and in uh, reform and whatever. Again, I think what you meant is conservative, yes. It's con religiously conservative, yes. Now, this can also be said maybe about more in, in a secular spectrum. So if we look at Judaism, not as a religion, but from a national perspective, why is it good or bad? <clears throat> to have a Jewish state. So some people will say Jewish um, Jewish uh, nationality or the Jewish ethos, Jewish culture is better in the Jewish state or it's worse because of the Jewish state. So you can have people, and I'll go again, from the bottom right, you have BDS Jews. 
who say, since Israel does not fulfill all of my values, it shouldn't exist. It is a problem for Jews that there's a Jewish state because it, it has a problems. It has problems. It has maybe big problems. And that's why it's okay if it doesn't exist. It doesn't, it's not up to my standards. So unlike, so for these Jews, they're very Jewish in this term that they don't care what China does. It's okay for China to torture or whatever. It, it can still exist because China is not supposed to fulfill any ideals. But the Jewish state is supposed to fulfill ideals. And if it doesn't fulfill them, it shouldn't exist. Okay? Going up. Yuval, we should yeah. slowly come to a close. Maybe you can quickly say the... Yeah, yeah. so basically the same kind of cycle like we see, saw in the religious spectrum, we can see in the sort of non-religious spectrum, you know, if it's, you know, better or worse, positive, you know, ideologically important or not important. And that's it. Thank you very much for everybody. And I really want to invite you now to ask questions. Um, maybe the first that I want to respond is James. So if James has some thoughts or something that he wants to say. So I am the Israeli Jew, kind of. I'm talking from inside the state of Israel, kind of. I was born and raised there. My mother tongue is Hebrew. I am linked to Israel. Uh, that's where I live. That's the websites, uh, news that I read. Uh, the TV that I watch, it's not just Shtisel, it's all the rest that Israel has to offer, um, or not, depending if you like it or not. Um, so for me, I, I'm Israeli, I'm sort of coming from inside of the state. James is very Jewish, but he was born and raised in Vienna, and he has a very different perspective, maybe the same view, but different perspective. So I would very much like to invite James now. James Moser from Vienna to say okay. what he has anything to say. Yeah. Hi there. Thank you. But um, so <laughs> I understood I was supposed to summarize the session as well and explain uh, who I am and talk about myself. So yeah, I'm going to try to do all those things until somebody shuts me out. But <laughs> um, basically, uh, so my name is James Moser. I was born and raised in Vienna. But you hear that I speak American English because my mother is American and I also spend part of my life in the U.S. I uh, have a bachelor's degree in Judaic studies from Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. And then I worked in nonprofit management and higher education management for a long time before returning to grad school. And I'm now a graduate student in the Hochschule für Jüdische Studien in Heidelberg, but I'm in Vienna because COVID. So, and I collaborate on, on projects with Yuval. And um, it's good that Yuval introduced me the way he did because uh, he may not actually know that sometimes I notice when I discuss topics with Yuval that actually there's certain things he doesn't see because he is grounded in Israel. So uh, he doesn't see things that I see about the reality of being a Jew in Vienna. What does it mean to be a Jew in Vienna? So there are certain things that have to do with identity or like, you know one's place in society you might just goes out and does something. And I'm like, oh, and like, I think about it maybe. And I'm like, oh, but I can't do that because this, that, and the other. And so certain baggage that I have and that I carry because I, I grew up in what I sometimes call a successor state to Nazism, he didn't. He grew up in the Jewish state. So he was always surrounded by Jews. And, and that is an experience I didn't have when I grew up. Um, so that's that about me. I just wanted to actually answer in, in the interest of time, rather than summarize the, the session, I wanted to just answer a few questions that came up and then also just lend my perspective in that, in that sense. So Amy asked a question uh, at the very beginning, um, like what, what do people mean when they say Bible? Um, and and uh, I think she also asked a question about like how, how many Jews follow Jewish law versus the law of the land. So I just want to respond to that. Uh, in a very general sense. And so the word Bible is super problematic when we talk in, a, in an inter, inter, 
uh, problematic in the sense that it's confusing. Uh, when, when we talk in a, in a Jewish Christian um, dialogue context of any kind. So the word Bible is, is, is something we actually have to define when we are talking about something. So um, in the Jewish context, the Bible is, is the Hebrew Bible. So what in, 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 in secular sort of like study of religion, we call the Hebrew Bible. So that will be the, the Torah and the books of the prophets and the writings, that's the Hebrew Bible. And so that's, and that's what we mean when as Jews, we speak of the Bible, we don't include the, the New Testament in that sense. So then that, that's when, to be clear, we say the Christian Bible. So then it's, then it's understood. Um, or we simply use Hebrew terminology to, to, to say Tanakh for the Hebrew Bible, exactly like what Sava just shared, to be very precise. But, but when, when, we, when we speak in English or German, like it's, it's, it's often people just kind of flippantly will say Bible. And of course, that, that raises the question, like, what do you mean? Um, and in terms of Jewish law versus law of the land, this is a funny sort of like Ouroboros question almost because it is part of Jewish law to follow the law of the land. So if you if you follow Jewish law to the T, you will follow the, the, the laws of the country you live in. Uh, that is one of the things you have to do. So, uh, <laughs> but I know that that's maybe not what you asked. Um, so in terms of like, maybe you asked more the question of like like proportions of Jews who are who are fully observant and and those who are secular. And I think that's something that Yuval sort of showed with his pie chart. Um, so we're gonna go on. A little bit about Abraham Yitzhak Kakoen Cook, who, who um, we, we saw a photo of him. It's quite a striking figure, with very like, glowing eyes. Uh, and then um, he was a rabbi from the diaspora who moved to a British mandated Palestine. And he, he is seen as the founder of religious Zionism. And what's very interesting about his biography is that he actually came from two different religious Jewish. Uh, movements and so in his life and, and as a person combined these two opposites so he uh, one side of his family is Hasidic and one side of his family is is not Hasidic so different kind of orthodox which in fact are oppositional groups that don't agree on many things and so he as a as a person you know combines these two and then on top of that you know was a Zionist who interpreted Zionism in a religious sense through the lens of religion and, and it is, he, he was a prolific writer. He wrote many, many, many books and, and it's interesting to read him, but it's also hard to understand him. So like, you know, like he's a fascinating person, but it's also not, it's not easy reading. <laughs> um, and so he is, he is the founder of religious Zionism. But when you look at photos of him, you know, he looks like a Hasidic rabbi. So it's very interesting when you, when you know people who are religious Zionists today, you kind of see how they live in the world. They don't look like, like Rabbi Cook, so it, it, it's it's interesting, sort of like also how things are dynamic and how, how Judaism is dynamic as a culture and a practice and a religion, including one's relationship to um, to uh, to Zionism to the state of Israel. Um, Dina asked a question. She said, "You know, how how can you?" Well, well she raised the the problem. She said, "You know, how can you love your uh, your your fellow man when you when you live in a country uh, that is at war with one's neighboring country? That's a very interesting sort of ethical question. I think that people around the world struggle with, and that is interesting in terms of of what it what it means for Jewish religion because when we look at the idea of the Messiah." In, 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 in Jewish thought, there isn't one, one way of thinking of what the Messiah is, whether the Messiah is a person, like what the person that is, when, when this person will come, what this person will do, whether the Messiah is a, is a state of being, of, of humanity, and, um, or both, or whether this person will bring a state of being for the humanity that is fundamentally different from the state of being that we're in now. And so one thing that comes up a lot is that the Messiah can only come when we all get along, <laughs> sort of, you know, Kumbaya, but but uh, it's a real that, that's sort of like a different way of framing the commandment of love, a love your a love your neighbor as yourself, because it sort of brings home why this is such an important commandment. Because you know it is only if we do this and if we truly keep this commandment and we live according to it that Mashiach can even come. Yeah, that this this can ever happen, and it means amongst Jews and with non-Jews so that, you know, we must get along as Jews amongst our, ourselves, which is super hard to do. And then 
we have to get along with everyone else that we encounter. Uh, so that it's not about an elitism and it's not about, it's not about an elitism, like I'm a better Jew than you. And it's not about I'm a better person because I'm a Jew and you're not. So it's like, it's all of these things have to happen. Uh, da, 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 I'm just kind of looking at like what else I want to bring up. Um, then I'm going to disagree with Yuval only very slightly in, in, in a nuance uh, about the Imitatsu Day thing. Um, so Imitatsu Day, and of course, in the Christian sense is whatever it is in the Christian sense, but there's a little bit a way that we can sort of like, you know, push the envelope in the Jewish sense. And that is that, yes, of course, God is not, God doesn't have a body. God is not, is not a person in, 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 in Jewish thought, but God has attributes. And because God has attributes and God emanates these attributes into the world, and these are things that we experience in our relationship to God, these are also things that we can emulate as people. And so, and, and it is by doing that, that we also then sort of become, not become like God, but be, become closer to God. So, and, and, and if that is our goal, if that is our religious goal or spiritual goal to come closer to God, imitating these attributes is, is, is something that, you know, if you want to call that imitatio day, you have my blessing. <laughs> but it's like, you know, and so an example would be something like um, kindness or wisdom, you know, so just to do, to, you know, to, live to live as a kind person to you know promote kindness in in in, in one's life you know to strive for wisdom and understanding that uh, that would be or or bringing it back to the uh you know this this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself like like you know this is something that god commands me to do so it's probably something that god also does although that that that's a whole can of worms i'm going to not die on that hill and i'm going to stop and go on to the next thing I want to say, which is, you know, Israel in and of itself as a, as a, as a polity, as a country, and as a place where cultures coexist, is a place that is ever changing. And so when you follow Israeli pop culture, you can actually sense how Israel in the last two decades has, has very much centered itself in the Middle East in a way that it wasn't in the 70s or in the 60s. So Israeli pop culture is very, very, very Middle Eastern. If you listen to Israeli pop you will always hear a Middle Eastern vibe. And even if it's a different genre, they'll always throw in a bar that's Middle Eastern. So even if you, you're listening to a song, say that's disco, there's gonna be a bar in that disco track that is Arabic, you know, just to sort of like get that in there. And, and, it, and, and this is a trend. And, and it's so, so people really do see themselves as part of the Middle East and it's no longer an affectation or just a pop cultural thing because with the signing of the Abraham Accords last year, it's also becoming a political reality. Um, and I see there's some questions coming up. Keep posing them, we'll, we'll get to them as I, as I, as I wrap up my, my piece. Um, and if you, know, if, if you don't know what the Abraham Accords are, there were, there were uh, some peace treaties that were signed last year. And so for instance, now you can fly nonstop from Tel Aviv to Dubai and to Bahrain and to Abu Dhabi. This is something that was completely unheard of since the, state, uh, the, the founding of the State of Israel until last year. It was impossible. The only place around Israel that you could fly to was Amman and Cairo. And the whole Cairo thing is very complicated too, but it exists. Yeah? And now there's a choice of airlines that you can fly to Abu Dhabi, you can fly to Dubai. And, and this is so much more than just capitalism. And it's so much more than just like, oh, someone's selling a ticket on an airline. But it, like, it really shows that there are, there are um, full relationships now between these countries that have signed these accords and Israel. And so it also opens up the discourse on, um, you know, being an Israeli who visits one of those countries, being a Jew who's not an Israeli who visits one of those countries. So for, an, for a diaspora Jew such as myself, you know, I can't just go to any country. Like I can't do that. I can't go to Saudi Arabia as a tourist. You know, there's a, there's an exit, there's an exit on the highway to Mecca that says Jews, you know, Jews, and, and Christians this way, you know, like you can't go, you can't go to Mecca, you know, truthfully, honestly, if you're not Muslim. So that, you know, and this has to do with the, pol the political um, relationships. Or so for instance, you know, if you're an Israeli citizen, you can't fly in Kuwait Airways. You know, there, there, there was a whole, you can Google this, there's all kinds of discrimination lawsuits in Germany because an Israeli citizen was denied, denied a, a ticket on, on, on Kuwait Airways from London to New York, and he sued in German court, and the Germany, you know, went after that because that's a form of discrimination according to German law. But this all has to do with um, with uh, 
with the politics in the Middle East and how Israel is respected. And then this also informs how, how Jews are looked at. So that brings home to the point of what it means, what is Israel and, and what is one's relationship to Israel as a diaspora Jew. It, you, know, you, you have a relationship to Israel one way or another. Um, this idea of like who's a Zionist is, is something that is very, very difficult to, to parse out. You can't really separate Zionism, in my opinion, Zionism from Judaism, unless you do a very, very radical break. And that is why those people who do that, they're very few in number. And so there would be people like the Naturekata that we saw, those, those very religious people who say that, you know, Israel is, 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 a, is an evil state because it doesn't follow it doesn't follow God's law. And then there are those people who are frankly, mostly secular who are, you know, if you like in the, in the radical left, you know, who, who say things like, you know, you know, they support the BDS movement, which is basically just a clandestine wing of Palestinian nationalism. But like, you know, that the, the, those are <laughs> small discrete groups, I would, in my opinion. Um, and other than that, you know, the word Zionist has gotten a bad rap because of the BDS movement, because of propaganda that exists in in uh, in in the media and in the culture out, out there, and um, there is this sort of like this this idea from non-Jews to tell the Jews not only who is a Jew, but who is a Zionist and who is a Jew. So th this idea of like, oh, you know, I don't hate Jews, but I hate Zionists. And it's like, well, then basically you hate Jews because that you can't really you can't really separate these two. And then I wanted to answer or expound a little bit something that Olivier mentioned about like what is he was talking about what is secular. Um, so I wanted to just explain like how this works in 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 Hebrew and in Israel and what this word secular means and then also what it means for people in the diaspora. So the the Hebrew word for secular is chiloni and chiloni is is often used as a as a, um, a label for identity, sort of like what kind of a Jew you are, you are a Chiloni Jew. And people use that for themselves to refer to themselves as Chiloni, but others also refer to, refer to those people over there who are not like me, they are Chiloni. And the threshold to be defined as Chiloni is very low, depending on who you ask. But it can, it can simply be that, you know, in my eyes, this person over there who regularly violates this one law, he violates just, just this one commandment, that person is secular. That person is not a religious Jew because he violates this one law. And, and I'm not checking in with this person whether they, or do I even care whether this person um, sees himself as Jewish or as a Jew or as an observant Jew or, or some kind of religious Jew. I don't care because I saw that. And so I'm just going to say that person is, is Chiloni. It's a very interesting binary definition of, of creating a fake division between secular and religious, but it has gotten very popular and people use it very flippantly and very liberally in Israel. And this has also then been brought into language in the diaspora. And then when, when one says conversely, what is a religious Jew? It's like, you know, who gets to define that? which is one more thing that I want to stress. Um, and that is this, you know, we can't make, we can't make generalizations, of course, we can't make generalizations about anyone, but we can't make generalizations about Orthodox Jews. So this, this word Orthodox Jews is just, just as useless of a label as is, as is secular, because again, it means like who's talking, who's defining, who's saying what. So for instance, we had an example of this, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot for this, but like um, we saw that little photo of the Naturekata, which are an incredibly small group yeah, um, of people who, who, who live in Israel. They are certainly Orthodox Jews, very, very observant, um, but they don't recognize the state of Israel and they, they are activists opposing the authority of the state, which mm -hmm. is a, it's a very paradox thing that you live in a state that, whose authority you oppose. If you did that in Austria, in fact, you will go to prison. Uh, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't oppose. You can't oppose the the authority of the state of Austria as an Austrian citizen and resident. You cannot do that. Um, so called Staatsverweigerer. There's a very strange, uh, very strange legal case in in Styria about that. So what what I want to say is, when you are 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 interested and you're talking about uh, identities and Jewish identities and, and specifically when you talk about orthodoxies, recognize 
that that you have to use this word, but it doesn't really say much because Orthodox Jews differ amongst themselves also uh, a lot in, uh, in beliefs, identity, political views, practices, and customs. And so even there, we have to sort of like, you know, always be more specific and, and contextualize sort of like what, what is what. Yeah, I wanted to ask, so my understanding I'm, um, from the from the Christian faith is that the the kingdom of God, okay, um, heaven heaven is right now right here is is attainable right now right here at this moment, and uh, what what I'm asking is the like in the Jewish uh, uh, understanding the Messiah is going to come in the future. So does it does it hamper the peace uh, at this moment? Are we are we moving the peace away for to be found in the future? I, I That's don't what peace from a political perspective. What do you mean? Like you say, the for me, like when you say the Messiah is going to come in the future, how do you make uh, peace at the moment? <laughs> Well, I can respond to that question in, mm -hmm. in the sense that, that um, yes, in Jewish thought, the Messiah is, is, is a future occurrence. And whether that is a person or a state of being mm -hmm. is, is also not clear yeah, um, or defined. It can be either. It can be both. And something that we do know is that, is that, is that in order to get there, for Mashiach to come, we have to get along. <laughs> and so that is peace. So we like, there's no world peace. You know, the world, the world is hurting and is broken and there's so many things going on. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we don't have enough time to, to look at all the many wars and, and things that, that, are, that are going on that are political that are caused by us not getting along. So, so, so in a nutshell, in a very sort of, you know, um, uh, concentrated short way of saying it is that you know like we we have to get along with other people because it's mm -hmm. not happening yet it's not and and we have to do and we have to make we have to make peace and if we if we accomplish that that we all truly get along only then the messiah will come mm -hmm. and and something that is a tension in 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 this idea is that and that is why some people don't accept the state of israel is that the Messiah can only come if we all get along and so forth and so forth. And then also there, there will be a state of Israel and there will, you know, all Jews will live in Israel then. Um, is that how can you have a state if the Messiah hasn't come yet? And, and so, so there's this sort of like, does the Messiah come because we, we make peace or, or, or will we make peace because the Messiah comes? Like that, that is sort of mm -hmm. like a sort of like chicken mm -hmm. egg kind of thing. And, 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 and opinions do, do differ uh, on that. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Thank you. Deepesh wanted to ask something before. I don't know if there's time for him. Um, let's Deepesh, see. The... Deepesh, did you want to, before you wanted to have a question? Are you with us? Okay, he doesn't seem He's to get a coffee. Oh, went to get a coffee. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, um, is there, are there any more questions or thoughts or, or ideas that people want to express? Um, yeah, I would just uh, like to know from you, Yuval, and, and maybe James too. And we, we heard a lot about a big spectrum, how you can see Israel. And, but how do, how do you see that the, State of Israel is existing now. Where is it in the spectrum um, of of this? Because you read this this chart, this uh, the independence charter, and there's many things in there that uh, I can't, I, I don't see, like the, that they have to be relig religious freedom and you don't discriminate against Muslims or Christians. But this doesn't seem to be the case. So I would just, yeah, want to know what. What do you see? Where do you see the Israel right now? Okay, I mean, I'm of course a bit biased uh, since this is my 
my home. Um, but but to me, I don't see any necessarily any theological importance in the state of Israel. It is, I would hope, and that's what Herzl hoped, that Israel will be really a country in a sense like, like uh, all other countries, that it can live in peace and be just a country of, of Jews as a, as a group, as a national group. So I don't see it as a, as a, as a state that has to um, impose a certain religiosity on the Jews. Of course, that is because from the get-go, there is no consensus on what this religiosity would look like. So there's all sorts of Jews, with all sorts of ideas about what should Jews do and not do. And, you know, also in the details, you know, how, what does the Shabbat mean? What does Kashrut mean? What, you know, also in the little details, but also in the big ideas of what it means to be a practicing Jew. There's no consensus. So once you give this power to the state, the state defines what it means to be a good Jew, and then everybody needs to be that kind of good Jew. I think that is dangerous from religious perspective and political perspective. So I don't see, so I would personally prefer to see a separation of, of state and religion, but not a separation of tradition and culture and nationality from the state. You know, just like Christmas for, for Europe, uh, the state needs to uh, express, you know, the, 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 the day of rest should be Saturday. And pe most people will have off in the Jewish New Year and not the Gregorian New Year. So I, I, see, I see this kind of as the positive way to, as the way forward kind of of the relationship between state and, and, and uh, religion. So I see it basically as a positive thing ability for Jews to express themselves in a Jewish environment, but I don't see it as necessarily being theologically loaded. So that's my, because I don't know what God wants or not. I don't uh, pretend to know. So that's, that's my opinion. Is that clear? I hope it's clear, Oliver. Um, uh, yes. Okay. I would also actually be interested what uh, Netanyahu's Israel at the moment Wait, is okay. in your eyes. That's a different story, but, but that's okay. No, okay, but, I, can, I can say that. But this is the, the, the question of Netanyahu and exactly what kind of government is or not. It's a different question. But, but I, I fully accept it because I think Israel is not a divine, uh, is not a tool in the, high, in the hand of God. It is a human endeavor, and as a human endeavor, it can have good people and bad people, and it can have people with good ideas and with bad ideas. I'm personally not a Netanyahu supporter, and I would love to be to see him out of office, but it doesn't mean that I think that the whole, you know, the whole project of Israel is doomed because of it, um, and. And um, also, if it was the other way around, and you know, I would be the prime minister, not that I want to be at all. I think it's the worst job in the world. But you know, even if, I, if, and if Israel would be exactly my, would be made exactly to my blueprint, I still wouldn't think that Israel is, is the best state in the world just because of that. Or, you know, it does not have, it, it is not, again, it is not tool in the hands of God. It is a human endeavor with human problems. And also the question of, you know, if you, you can really see it now if Netanyahu, he's trying everything to be prime minister now, including things that were never thought of, things that are opposed to by religious people that before liked him or, or the other way around and his coalition with more right-wing religious uh, parts of, of, of the population. It is a purely political act done in a political environment has nothing or very, at least very little to do with, um, with anything religious or, or in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, hope, I hope that's expressed enough. Okay.
So I have very little to add to that, but I but I do want to say one thing, which is when you, when you read that that excerpt about the in the presentation of about you know the charter uh, independence charter of Israel, yeah, sure, there's some things in there that you know they're probably not happening today, but one of the things that isn't happening is that you know when it says like Israel Israel will like like you know follow something the tenets of the United Nations. Well, the United Nations doesn't really like Israel. I mean, we can have that whole conversation. Of why is that happening? What does that mean? Um, that's very interesting too, because both the state of Israel and the United Nations have, have, have changed very much since 1947. So the, in all sorts of directions. But yes, Israel is, Israel is, a, is, a, is a state, a human state, and, um, and as such, completely imperfect. And I think I think I think that will, that that is a a good way to um, to sort of frame it in order to even be able to try to answer many questions that are very very difficult. Yeah. Thank you, Yuval. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Yuval, so much for doing this once again with us. Thanks, James, for your insights, um, for your patient understanding, and your sharing. Um, we look forward to working with both you well and you in the future. Let's hope we can, when all this is uh, behind us as a pandemic, that we can have such sessions in life, in person, uh, here in Vienna um, or somewhere in Austria. Thank you so much for your time. I thank you, Damaris, for uh, patiently uh, translating the, the whole time. Thank you so much. And thank you. thank you to all of you for being part of this. Um, we look forward to our next session, which is on the 29th of May. Uh, Georg, can you quickly share it? It's um, going to be a, a discussion on equality, which is at the heart of Sikh ideology uh, by Dr. Nikki Gurinder Singh, who will join us from the US. Um, and because she's uh, joining us from Boston, we have a bit of a time uh, change. So the session would be at four o'clock, please note, and not at 2.30 um, and 7.30 in India.